Okay, but we're still going to take a couple of questions for the Q and A portion here. Um, if I could have Dr. Hyman and Dr. Zippo both come back on. Um, we'll start with one that just came in for Dr. Kadani because you just spoke, but it's Okay, the question is, Dr. Kadani, why isn't ciliopathy language used more frequently? And, have, and if so, how has AI changed your lab's capabilities? And have you used it for gene clustering? So, yeah, I, 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 I guess I've known Max for quite a while and he's, he's worked in this field a little bit. Um, I, I don't think we originally went in thinking that it was going to be a ciliopathy, but I think this is where we communicate with clinicians such as Jackie and Brittany, where we ask them, are, are individuals starting to develop issues such as hearing loss, vision loss, and kidney issues? And when we start to hear those, those kind of manifestations, we start to think, are cilia involved? Because very few other uh, insults with, will cause those type of defects in collection. And so when it comes down to machine learnings, we, we really, I, I think it was mostly due to our collaborations with uh, one of our neighbors, Bala, which helped to teach us, we need to start to analyze big data sets because otherwise I, I think we're left with these large data sets such as 5,199 changes for us. And I think 1,700 changes for Max, like how, how do you find the needle in the haystack? And I think the only way to do that is through machine learning and, kind of hypothesis generations through big data. Otherwise, I think we'll be stuck at trying to investigate like just epigenetic changes. I think we need to push the field forward using the technology that's available. Thank you. So does anybody else wanna weigh in on that or should we go to the next question? Already. So this next question is asking why are why are mice the most used animal for preclinical studies for humans? Um, and is that just a legacy or is the thinking that actual sea elegans or zebrafish might be better? That's a good question, right? Uh, partly it's a legacy for sure. Partly it's that I think mice are historically the mammalian system that's been around the longest. And so not only historically in terms of inertia, but also in terms of the number of tools that are available, they've been developed longer in that system and there's a long history there. Uh, but as I mentioned, each of these systems has its own strength. So it's tempting to see mice as little humans, but of course they're not, they're very different. And depending on what kinds of questions you wanna ask, fish have their own strengths, the elegants have their own strengths. It's all about using all of these tools and then combining the knowledge to get the most complete picture possible. Great. Okay, now the next question is for biological changes in C. elegans, like the amount of KMT2D protein in the animal model, but not the symptomatic or phenotypic changes. So I guess the question is, you know, wh what are the difference between phenotypic and systematic changes in C, C. elegans? And are, are memory or visuospatial effects in C. elegans? Like, do we, see the, do we see the difference in the memory and the visuospatial effects in C. elegans like we do in mice? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. It's related to a broader question of what kinds of questions are you even able to ask in C. elegans? So I emphasized all the strengths of it, that you're able to work very quickly and cheaply, and you're able to go quickly from single cells to the complete animal, but there's some things that are very difficult to ask. So for example, if you're interested in craniofacial development, worms don't have faces. So it's very hard to ask those kinds of questions, right? They do have memory, they do have behavior and learning. We haven't done those assays ourselves, but we're well set up for that. And interestingly, related to uh, Dr. Kadani's point about the ciliopathies, we do, as we're doing our clustering, see um, a strong enrichment for genes involved in sensory neurons which are the only ciliated cells in C. elegans. And so I think that could be a really interesting area of future overlap. Uh, but in terms of which kinds of the phenotypic changes you can look at, I think you're focused more on changes that are at single cells and small groups of cells connecting to each other at the tissue level. And some things like memory or something like craniofacial development or heart development are probably better addressed in vertebrate systems like fish or mice. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next question, and we'll wrap up after this, is for Dr. Zippo. 
Um, does the mechanism as, um, as being described relate to speed of processing and or muscle tone and connective tissue aspect often the, the, the connective tissue aspect often seen in Kabuki syndrome? Yes, uh, so not yet, uh, let's say. Uh, so uh, as it was uh, underlined before by, by Max, uh, the, uh, the fish system is uh, quite simple for the, uh, detecting the craniofacial aspects, uh, especially during the development. Uh, but we did not uh, yet investigate whether um, there were any connection related also, also with the, with the myogenic aspects. So this is something that we would like to address, but when we're going to uh, start uh, in the next month uh, using the mouse model, because I think there are, it would be, it would be uh, easier uh, to define also these uh, aspects. My expectation would be that there are some connections, uh, but uh, I'm not really sure whether we could uh, somehow um, recapitulate completely this pattern and whether the compound could, could, uh, could rescue also these kind of uh, alterations. Okay, great. And I just got to note that we do have a little bit more time. So I'm going to go with one more question. And the question is, are there any existing drugs which target ATR? Yes, oh, there, there, are, there are many. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the advantage of our approach is that we are reproposing drugs that are already available for clinical trials that have been already used. Uh, uh, specifically for treating uh, uh, oncological patients. There are multiple. So we have patent the usage of these drugs for treating Kabuki syndromes. So um, our hope is that uh, now we have kind of, uh, space uh, to verify whether these are compatible uh, for a full clinical trial, starting from a preclinical uh, study. So we have a pipeline of 11 drugs that we're going to test uh, our best it and then we go down to the, to the list. And uh, if we would succeed, then we can, we can move. But these drugs are already available, so they're already synthesized. We have a lot of knowledge about their usage, the tolerance of this, of this drug. So if everything goes well, it could be quite fast, uh, you know, moving towards, uh, towards the clinics. Great, and then there was one more question that just popped in here for you, Dr. Zippo, and it is, do you have any plans to develop KDM6A fish, zebrafish? Uh, actually, we did already, and they, uh, they've been already published. But uh, um, so this uh, can be done quite, quite, uh, quite uh, easily. And also, as uh, Andrew underlined, and we had exactly the same results, when you uh, uh, reduce the level of protein of KMTP, Automatically, we have an uh, instability of the uh, product of KDMC, say, which is uh, UTX. We really think that uh, the balance of the abundance of this protein can be uh, retrieved by either reducing the level of one gene or, or the other. While within the human beings, we have uh, the majority of mutations occurring on KMTBD gene instead of UTX. This is not really, really clear, but yes, it is absolutely uh, feasible as, as a Okay, thank you so much.